The following special program is a Viva Florida 500 production developed in coordination with the Florida Department of State and the Friends of the Museum of Florida History. The program is brought to you by the Florida League of Cities, the united voice of Florida cities. The Florida Lottery, just imagine. And Florida Blue, in the pursuit of health. Hello, I'm Ileana Borella, and I'm going to introduce you to the longest recorded history of any American state, Florida. Florida's history is rich, it's culture diverse. The flags of five countries have flown over Florida, Spain, France, Great Britain, the Confederacy, and the United States. For more than 250 years, the Spanish flag flew over Florida. That's longer than the U.S. flag has flown over the state. Florida has seen remarkable changes over the last 500 years. Let's take a look. Florida's original people date back at least 12,000 years. They were the first pioneer land developers, growing maize, beans, squashes, and pumpkins. Along the shores, they consumed fish, oysters, and clams. They hunted animals and foraged for wild plants. They had no written language of their own, but left their history underground in the form of artifacts. We know their groupings by name. The Pensacola, Chateau, and the Apalachicola in the Northwest. The Apalachee around present-day Tallahassee. The Tamuqua in the northern half of the peninsula. The Calusa in the Southwest. The Tequesta at Biscayne Bay. And the Metacumbe in the Keys. When Europeans first arrived, Florida's native populations numbered an estimated 350,000, with the largest number being Timucuans, Apalachee, and Calusa. The introduction of European diseases would have a devastating effect on these original Floridians. The better-known Seminoles entered the Florida historical record in the 1700s. Seminoles consisted of Creeks and other Indian tribes of the region, as well as runaway black slaves. The name Seminole is derived from the Spanish word Seminone and the Muscogee Seminole, both meaning runaway. The evidence of Florida's distinct and diverse Indian populations is understood by scholars because of archaeological excavation and research of structures and artifacts, as well as the recorded history of Spanish and French explorers. When Juan Ponce de Leon arrived on Florida's shores, it was springtime. People in Spain were celebrating Pascua Florida, or Festival of Flowers, the country's annual commemoration of Easter. That celebration and beautiful lush vegetation inspired Ponce de Leon to give a lasting name to what he thought was an island, La Florida, meaning the flowery land. Ponce de Leon's journey to Florida in 1513 was the result of many failed efforts by other explorers to find a western route to the Orient, home of spices, silks, and wealth. Ponce de Leon found success, however, by laying claim to new lands and expanding the Spanish Empire. In 1521, Ponce de Leon embarked on his last voyage, a return trip to Florida where he and a group of would-be settlers were met by fierce, Gulf Coast Indians, Calusa warriors. Ponce de Leon was shot with an arrow and fled to Havana, Cuba, where he later died of his injuries. Spaniard Tristan de Luna established a short-lived settlement at Pensacola Bay in 1559. However, France was also interested in exploring and colonizing the Americas. In 1564, 
René de la Donniere established Fort Caroline near the mouth of the St. John's River in Jacksonville. Over time, the settlement, known as Fort Caroline, began to suffer as food stocks dwindled and new provisions failed to arrive from France. Though weakened, the establishment was perceived as a threat to the Spaniards, who expelled the French, resulting in the first permanent and continuous European settlement in the United States, established in 1565. Its founder was one of Spain's most successful admirals, Pedro Menendez de Avales. Because his fleet first sighted Florida's shoreline on the feast day of St. Augustine, Menendez gave that saint's name to his colonial development. It is the city of St. Augustine. Florida historian Dr. Michael Gannon likes to say, by the time pilgrims came to Plymouth in 1620, St. Augustine was up for urban renewal. 42 years before the English settled in Jamestown, Virginia, and 55 years before the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts, Pedro Menendez de Aviles settled St. Augustine. Where Ponce de Leon landed earlier in 1513, and how that arrival has changed Florida, is something we will explore when we return. Many people think Ponce de Leon was searching for the Fountain of Youth when he accidentally arrived on Florida's shores. Did he ever find it? The first time the Fountain of Youth appears in Florida history was 100 years after Ponce de Leon arrived in Florida. Scholars today do not think he was ever looking for the mythological water. The arrival of Juan Ponce de Leon changed Florida forever. The products of ecosystems that had been separated for eons suddenly met and mixed in a process historian Alfred W. Crosby called the Columbian Exchange. This process was not limited to one person or one expedition. Rather, it was the collective result of explorers and conquistadors transplanting many kinds of plant and animal species to all of their points of arrival. The exchange took corn to Africa, sweet potatoes to East Asia, horses, wheat, and citrus to the Americas, rhubarb and eucalyptus to Europe. But it also swapped less desirable organisms, including insects, bacteria, and viruses, which took a toll on the native peoples. Hernando de Soto and his army arrived in Tallahassee during the late fall of 1539. This encampment would be the site for the first Christmas to be celebrated anywhere in the United States. Shortly after he established St. Augustine in 1565, Pedro Menendez invited the Franciscan order in Spain to evangelize and educate native Floridians. The friars founded their first mission near present-day St. Augustine at the end of the 16th century. Fifty years later, they numbered 70 missionaries and 38 churches. The western anchor was Mission San Luis de Talamali in modern Tallahassee. It is now a state historical and archaeological site that reenacts mission life in one of Florida's earliest communities. Fuego! Between 1702 and 1711, British colonists in the Carolinas and their Creek Indian allies raided Florida's Spanish missions and killed, enslaved, or displaced the natives. By virtue of the Treaty of Paris in 1763 that ended the French and Indian War, the British gained control of Florida and ruled it for the next 20 years. Historians suggest that this British rule ultimately benefited Florida's cities by establishing governing principles such as trial by jury, common law, and religious liberty. It was also the introduction to plantation life and divided Florida into two British colonies, East Florida and West Florida. Under British and Spanish rule, territorial leaders had recognized regional and local governance. Today, Florida has 410 municipal governments. These cities, towns, and villages will be hosting important Viva Florida 500 events, such as the arrival of tall ship replicas, historical reenactments like the first Christmas at Mission San Luis to highlight what no other state in the United States can claim. Florida was the first location in the current United States where explorers from all over the world visited and settled. 
There are more than 250 Viva Florida events planned in 2013. Visit vivaflorida.org for information on events and activities in your favorite Florida city. When we come back, a look at how wars, air conditioning, and mosquito control created a continuous population explosion for Florida. But first, a question about oranges and the mother of Miami. The mother of Miami used the land she inherited to entice a famous millionaire to help her create one of the most dynamic cities in the world. Julia Tuttle knew the railroad would be the key to her vision for a city on the Miami River. When the Great Freeze of 1894 wiped out fortunes and devastated the Orange Belt of Central Florida, she used gifts of land and oranges to entice Henry Flagler to bring his railroad further south. Thanks to her early efforts, Miami grew from a small town to an internationally known metropolis. Early statehood, the Civil War, and Reconstruction were catalysts for an ever-enlarging population of immigrants from northern states. In 1821, Florida became a United States territory. Florida became the 27th state in the Union in 1845. Florida, a slaveholding state, seceded from the Union just 16 years later and was the third state to join the Confederacy. An estimated 5,000 of Florida's sons died in the Civil War. The federally enforced Reconstruction period that followed the South's defeat in 1865 provided Florida's freed black population their first opportunities for education and participation in public life. Two unsung achievements for African Americans occurred just after the end of the Civil War. In 1868, Jonathan C. Gibbs was appointed Florida Secretary of State and in 1871, Florida sent its first African-American to Congress, Josiah T. Walls. It would be 121 years before Carrie Meek became Florida's second African-American congressional representative. After Reconstruction ended, the state was sharply divided between a white majority and the African-American minority. Discriminatory legislation such as black codes, Jim Crow laws, and poll taxes stripped African Americans of their political rights. By 1890, blacks could no longer vote in Florida, and their civil rights and social rights would not be restored until the second half of the 20th century. By 1880, 64% of residents were born in the state, a figure never to be equaled again in Florida history. Florida tourism became a growing industry with the development of transportation. The years of 1877 and 1920 could easily be called the Flagler era. Agriculture, particularly citrus and winter vegetables, took root in central Florida, and tourism became a growth industry. Standard oil tycoon Henry Morrison Flagler, owner of the East Coast Railroad, thought he could transform the state's Atlantic coast into an American Riviera. He built the Grand Hotel, Ponce de Leon in St. Augustine, and created the railroads from St. Augustine to Key West. Developer Henry B. Plant from Connecticut built the exotic Tampa Bay Hotel, and his rail line joined the Gulf Port of Tampa to the Atlantic Port of Jacksonville. Not even the oil and free land stampedes in the West matched the 1920s runaway land boom of Florida. In 1925, more than two and a half million people came to Florida, looking for their own piece of paradise. New cities emerged along the paths of Florida's new rail lines. During this period, the U.S. economy was prospering and car ownership was growing. Travel to the Sunshine State was easy and desirable. Miami, Coral Gables, Miami Beach, and cities in other regions offered irresistible pleasure domes to northern buyers. When Florida came to life between 1916 and 1926, 65 new cities were incorporated. These new cities brought opportunities for the state of Florida, brought opportunities for new residents to move into the state of Florida and raise their families and create new jobs and create new businesses. That runaway growth ended in 1926 when the boom went bust. People 
many who had never been to Florida, had made down payments on paper binders that were worthless. Florida entered the Great Depression three years ahead of the rest of the country. There was positive change to follow. Women began to have an active role in public life in the 1920s and 30s. May Man Jennings was a leader in the movement and wife of Florida's former governor William Sherman Jennings. May Man Jennings called on females to join the political arena where she and others fought for women's suffrage, conservation of the environment, compulsory education, the Florida State Library, a state park service, and Everglades National Park. Wars have ushered in other population changes in Florida. 2.1 million men and women poured into Florida for military training for World War II. Florida's year-round flying weather and level terrain resulted in 40 airfields and training facilities. The post-World War II population boom in Florida can be credited to air conditioning, mosquito control, and VA home loans. Men and women who had trained in Florida liked what they had seen and at war's end returned to make Florida their home. New residents arrived at a lightning pace, an average of 850 per day from the 1950s forward. Local and state governments were hard-pressed to provide appropriate infrastructure to serve the new masses. There was a great effort to meet demands with sufficient streets, highways, water, prisons, sewage systems, and K-12 classrooms. The influx of new residents affected Florida's cities. Beginning in 1946, the year after World War II ended, and until 1950, approximately 84 new cities incorporated. From St. Augustine, which was established in 1565 and incorporated in 1822, to Loxahatchee Grove, which is the most recently incorporated Florida city in 2006, Florida cities are unique expressions of their residents and how those residents want to live. The Cuban Revolution, Bay of Pigs invasion, and Cuban Missile Crisis were significant events that shaped Florida's history including one of the largest population shifts any state has ever experienced. In addition to the dramatic changes in population makeup, Florida was busy recruiting business and industry. In 1964, a different kind of shift began in Florida. Vast areas of land were quietly being purchased in lots of 5,000 and 20,000 acres at remarkably high prices. Rumors flew about who could afford it and who needed the land. On November 15, 1965, Walt Disney arrived in town and announced his plans to create the world's most spectacular theme park. The total cost of the project was $400 million to open, and the attraction drew 20 million visitors in the first two years. Additional attractions, hundreds of businesses, and millions of new Central Florida residents continue to change Orlando. Today, it is one of the best known vacation destinations in the world. The iconic political figure credited with making Florida such an inclusive state for people and business remains Florida Governor Leroy Collins. He actively recruited businesses and expanded higher education. He steered a moderate course for integration following the U.S. Supreme Court desegregation ruling Brown v. Board of Education. He was also a champion for year-round tourism. Since World War II, Florida's economy has also become more diverse, with high technology industries growing steadily. The U.S. space program, with its historic launches from Cape Canaveral, brought much media attention and economic benefit to Florida. Today, Florida strives to be a national and global leader in education. The university and community college system has expanded rapidly. Creative solutions to financial challenges for our schools and universities include the support derived from revenues generated by the Florida Lottery. To date, more than $24 billion have been generated for education by the Florida Lottery. We've come a long way from the days of the little one-room schoolhouse Florida has made it a priority to build a world-class K-12 and higher education system. It is an essential element of Florida's global competitiveness. Looking ahead, if we're going to compete on a world stage, 
We need a highly educated and skilled workforce. We need to attract new employers by the quality of our schools and universities. And we need to keep our most talented students here in Florida. Now that we've looked at Florida's history, when we come back, we'll take a peek into the future. Apalachicola on Florida's Gulf Coast may be best known for oysters, but a famous doctor who lived there had a major impact on Florida life still being felt today. Dr. John Gorey had a theory that bad air caused diseases. Based on his theory, he invented air conditioning and the first machine that made ice. Although he died impoverished in 1865, he made Florida a more comfortable place. If Ponce de Leon were traveling to Florida today, he would have the benefit of modern shipbuilding, advances in medicine, roads, bridges, improved communication systems, even global positioning devices. Many changes have transpired since 1513, and we can only imagine what the next 500 years will bring. The commemoration of Florida's unique history allows us to find common ground and unity regardless of our personal family heritage. We share life as Floridians, as well as a proud heritage of our state's role in American and global contributions. As we remember how far we have come and what we have in common, may we be better prepared to continue our national leadership role as a state of firsts as we collectively step into the future. Brought to you by the Florida League of Cities, the united voice of Florida cities. The Florida Lottery, just imagine. And Florida Blue, in the pursuit of health. 